Um, so welcome. I'm thrilled to be uh, to be here this evening, and I hope I know we're in for a great talk. Uh, my name is Karen Reed. I'm the acting principal here at Innes College. Charlie Kyle is the principal at the college and is here this evening. He's on leave this year, although he's been here a lot, which we've, I'm really happy about. Um, and <laughs> we've been laughing a lot today, so that may translate into some parts of this. Uh, so I will allow me to start with the, the land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So welcome to the Innes College Alumni Lecture. This is a lecture series that, that uh, Charlie started in 2019 and of course was interrupted by the pandemic. And so we're thrilled to have Melissa Franklin with us this evening uh, to, to talk about her work and her life. And after following uh, her talk, we will have a bit of a Q&A, which will be moderated by David Curtin, who's a, an assistant professor here in U at the U of T's Department of Physics, and he's the Canada Research Chair in Theoretical Particle Physics. David's current areas of research include, amongst others, the Higgs boson, long-lived particles, the hierarchy problem, and cosmology. And prior to joining U of T, uh, David completed his PhD at Cornell and held postdoc positions at Maryland and Stony Brook University. And tonight we're going to hear from uh, Melissa Franklin. Melissa is an experimental particle physicist who studies proton-proton collisions produced by the Large Hadron Collider. She's a collaborator on the ATLAS experiment, where she works in collaboration with over 3,000 physicists. Melissa was the co-discoverer of the top quark and the Higgs boson, and is currently studying the properties of the Higgs boson and searching for new physics beyond the standard model. Professor Franklin was born and raised in Canada and received her, her Bachelor in Science from the University of Toronto and her PhD from Stanford University. And in 1992, she was the first woman to receive tenure in the physics department at Harvard University. <laughs> Melissa graduated from the U of T in 1977, and I'm not sure that her approach to gaining acceptance at the U of T would really work that well today, in case there's any students or would-be students of the U of T. Uh, she persisted in uh, coming back day after day until finally they, they agreed to let her in. There's a lot more to that story, uh, but Melissa has many stories to tell us today, and so I will turn it over to her and, I'll, and look forward to hearing you speak. Hi. Everybody's looking in that direction. Hi, I just wanted to check who I'm talking to first. Are there, are there anybody under 30? <laughs> yes. Are there any physics students? Excellent. Okay, wonderful. Not that I like physics students, but I just want to know who's in the audience. Hi. So I'm going to, um, I was, uh, I was very lucky in my life, but the luckiest thing was to be admitted to Innes College because that was the only college that would accept me at University of Toronto. And University of Toronto uh, gave me a fantastic education in physics. Um, and I just want to say that uh, prior, the, reason, the way I got in <laughs> was basically by being an early hacker. I went to a free school uh, sort of in high school, and basically what that free school taught us was how to hack a system. So even though I didn't have a PA, even though I didn't have a high school di diploma, or even close, not, not even close, uh, I just uh, convinced them to let me in, and I think that that was sort of the beginning of being a scientist, because I think scientists are hackers. So I want to tell you, I'm, I'm going to take advantage of you. Um, I hope you don't mind. And I want to tell you about a woman who became my role model recently. Um, I didn't have one, and you know that's because I don't really like people that much. But I want to talk about her, and especially because she's a person who won the Nobel Prize, but nobody even knows who she is. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to tell you why. So, um, she, turns out that she, Maria Gepper Mayer, basically does the same kind of physics that I do. She did it with atoms, and I do it with elementary particles, which I hope to tell you about. 
Are there any, are there any questions? <laughs> no? <laughs> no? Okay. I would have had a role model, I just want to tell you first. I would have had a role model who was uh, this person, who turns out to be on the $100 bill if anybody has ever seen one. Um, and her name is Harriet Brooks, and she was a Canadian. And she was uh, Ernest Rutherford, he's a very famous guy, uh, his first graduate student. And she was amazing. Um, she was a student at McGill, and then she was a student at Bryn Mawr, and then she was a student at Cambridge, and then she taught at Barnard. She co-discovered radon and measured its atomic mass. She never got a PhD, and basically her life went like this. She was really smart and interesting, and then she hung out with Maxim Gorky. Do you know who he is? Maxim Gorky was an, uh, a writer, a Russian writer, who was very cool, and you should read his diaries if you haven't already. And then what happened is she just got married and died. So I, th I couldn't have her as my role model because of the last part. The Maxim Gorky part would have been perfect, but not the last part. So I would love to have had a Canadian as my role model, but no. This is what happened. Someone asked me, obviously a friend, because otherwise why would this happen, asked me to give an inaugural lecture called the Maria Geppert Mayer Lecture uh, at University of Chicago because Maria uh, worked there, although she wasn't paid there. And I asked my friend, what should I talk about? She said, talk about whatever you want, I don't care. So I said, okay, but then I went on Google. I went on Google and I started looking at pictures, photographs of Maria Geppert Mayer. So this is the first one. And um, this is when she was, uh, so she was, I'll tell you later, but she was born in um, Poland and grew up in uh, Göttingen, which is a university town in in Germany, and then she married some guy, some American guy, very tall guy, and she came to America. But here she is uh, teaching at Sarah Lawrence College, which is a small college uh, just outside of New York City. It was just for women. And I just want to show you something here. This is a faculty meeting, and look at all these women with the cross legs and the sensible shoes. And then look at Maria Geppert Mayer's feet. She's wearing loafers. She's putting her feet on a trestle. I just want to show you this a little bit more clearly. This was the first moment that I realized I might like this person. This could be a person who I really liked just looking at her feet. You see my point, right? Yeah, okay. Now look at her. Wow. Well, so you look at her and you go, this is fantastic. She looks like she's an intellectual. She looks like baggy eyes. She's a, she smokes constantly. Now, just for the young people here, obviously smoking is a bad idea, but it looks really good. I mean, I wish that smoking wasn't a problem because I would definitely want to look like this. So this was the second thing that made me think this could be my role model. And also, she's wearing some pretty wild clothing. <laughs> okay, you may say, why did that picture make you think that? And then I just want to bring your attention back to... Susan Sontag, clearly, looks the same, baggy eyes, cigarette. M Marguerite Yersenar, who's a, a, a French writer, here, look at that. Just great glasses. And then Chantal Ackerman, who was a, a fantastic Belgian um, film, filmmaker. And I thought, okay, now I have found a physicist who could be my role model because, of course, I'm in love with these women, except, of course, not the cigarettes. I don't know what replaces the cigarettes now. There's nothing. Sorry? <laughs> so, now, I just want to tell you something. Let's look at her again for a second here. I started reading everything I could about her because I got very intrigued, and there isn't very much written. And what is written is short. And it always tells the same story, which is not that interesting, about the fact that when she came to America, she couldn't get a job, et cetera, et cetera. She did um, work on the Manhattan Project. I met the people who wrote about her. I somehow went to meet them and talk to them, and I said, why is it that 
you know, not more is written. And they said, well, it's a sad story. She was, she was a chain smoker and a drunk. And I said, fantastic. This is, <laughs> this is great. This is exactly the kind of dissolute person, brilliant, chain smoker, alcoholic, perfect. Um, do you follow me here? <laughs> okay. So, so I started reading about her. I did everything. I went everywhere. She went to, she grew up in this place called Göttingen, and while she was there, this was the place for physics uh, in the 1920s, 1910s through 1930s. It was the most amazing place. And if you are a physicist or a mathematician, you will know that this man here, Hilbert, he was one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, and Nuther, Nuther, I don't know how to say it. Max Born, Nobel Prize winner, here in his lovely bathing suit, is seen with her. That was her thesis advisor. And then all of these people, you probably have heard of von Neumann and Oppenheimer, possibly Fermi. Remember him? Fermi, I like him. Anyhow, these, it was an amazing place. It was a really amazing place where she was first a mathematics student, and then she became a physicist. And her mathematics teacher was this person, Emmy Nuther. Is this boring yet? No. Yes? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 11, I'm sorry. It'll get racy really soon. <laughs> but do you like this picture? Do you like these people? Yeah, here's Emmy Nuther. He's, she's in fantastic. She really changed all of particle physics and mathematics by talking about symmetry and how symmetry was related to conserved quantities in physics. And I went uh, just last year to a one-woman play about her, and it was awful. It was just awful. And it wasn't because the actress was bad, the actor was bad. Um, it was because there was nothing. We knew nothing about what she thought except about... Um, equations, and theorems. And in fact, a great mathematician, Hermann Weyl, who loved her, I mean, loved her, admired her greatly, um, wrote a eulogy for her, and he said, uh, being with her is like being with a warm loaf of bread. <laughs> and it's kind of interesting because um, that's it. That's the whole story of Emmy Nuther. She, not, she can't be my role model, first of all, because she's so smart, it's ridiculous. But also, because she came to America, of course, during the, just uh, before the war, and then, and then immediately died. Um, I just want to say that uh, one of the things I've done since I went to this one-woman play was develop a new course in which I'm going to get all physics students to write 300 words a day about what they think about things, so that when they die, if they happen to have done something interesting, we can actually find out what they thought about something. You know, what did they think about Trump or not Trump? Um, okay, so just to say that uh, this is another reason I like her, the, the, the dress off. <laughs> Off the shoulder. Um, that that okay. Here, what's good about this photograph? I should have been a different person, actually. So uh, that's that's Maria Gephardt Mayer, not Emmy Nuther, because she was dead. And this is ki a king. That's a king of Sweden. And and look at this person. She's amazing, right? She's wearing a tiara, so I don't know what that means. But maybe she's the queen. Do you like these pictures? Okay. <laughs> Okay, I just want to tell you now, it's, we're going to do some physics, if that's okay. So, um, here's the thing. There's stuff, not very interesting, still not very interesting. Oh, here's an atom. That's what Maria worked on. She worked on atoms. And then inside the atom is a nucleus in which there are neutrons and protons, still pretty ridiculously large. And then um, there's quarks, and that's what I work on. So, Maria died in 1967 let's call it 67, <laughs> roughly. And she did not know about any of these things except uh, the electron and the muon. So I'm going to talk about what some s interesting things she did, and then I'm going to talk about something I'm working on. Are you going to be bored still? 
Do you want me to shine this at you? Would that be better? <laughs> okay, so the first thing that was kind of interesting is beta decay. Beta decay is when a neutron, a neutron decays. Neutrons decay, protons don't, which is a good thing because th then we c I'm still here. So neutrons decay, and the way they decay is by something called beta disintegration, and it looks something like this. Here's a nucleus with some neutrons in it, and what you see is all of a sudden an electron jumps out, and the neutron goes away. But what's really happening it is the neutron de decays into a proton, an electron, and a neutrino. And we say decay, but what we mean is turns into. So just take decay, meaning turning into. OK, so what was kind of interesting is we all knew about beta decay for, for a long time, but Someone, she wanted to know, and this was a paper written just by her in 1935, she wanted to know what happens if two neutrons decay at the same time? How likely is that, and should we be worried about it? Should we be holding on to our pocketbooks? And what she found was that, well, the half-life for that kind of double decay is about 10 to the 17 years, which is pretty short. 10 to the 17, so... <sighs> It's pretty short. You're thinking, no, it seems long, right? But it's pretty short because there's a lot of neutrons. So I just wanted to tell you exactly about the difference between humans and elementary particles. Just, I, I just, this is just a piece of information you're going to need to know. And I just want to tell you that I made this plot. It's not, there isn't one. I just made this up. But I think it's reasonably correct. Um, so. An elementary particle has a very weird quantity, because it's a quantum mechanical thing, has a weird quality that uh, if you start with 100 elementary particles and you find out how many particles there are as a function of time, so time goes forward here, and you say, how many particles are there? Well, it goes down exponentially, really fast. And that's what happens if every minute the elementary particle flipped a coin. If it, if it was big enough, and it would decay if the coin was heads, and it would not decay if the coin was tails. So that's what an elementary particle does. And it has something like a lifetime that we talk about. We say the lifetime of the particle. It's characteristic. Humans, on the other hand, if you have 100 at the beginning, well, some may not make it at the very beginning, but as a function of age, it's pretty, you know, they pretty hold on until at the very end, whoa, they go down like that. So humans are not random. Did, did you know that? What, does anybody have a problem with this? Okay, so humans seem to have a clock inside, some kind of telomere thing. So this is the difference between the two. We're much more interested in these kind of things and not these kinds of things because that's another field. And the other thing we know is that particles, elementary particles, have, they have a mass, they have some kind of weight and some kind of lifetime that we just said. Somehow, the particle knows when to decay, but it just doesn't decay all at the same time. For instance, you know, some, some of these things with a lifetime will decay early here and some late. Okay, so that's all I want you to know. So we can measure particles by saying a particle travels and then it decays, so A decays to B and C, and we can just see how long it travels. And if we measure it many, many times over many, many, many of these particles, we can get a lifetime. Okay, that's all you need to know. This is just a pretty picture. This is the kind of picture that particle physicists draw so that we understand things. And this is what is double beta decay. I'm not going to explain it to you, it's just so beautiful. But on the left, you have just two neutrons decaying through beta decay at the same time. As soon as, uh, as soon as old Maria had written this paper, another guy who's kind of interesting, you will like this one, another Italian guy who worked for Fermi named Majorana said, uh, oh, do you know what? I think the neutrino, which is a particle that has almost no mass and one can hardly ever talk to, uh, I guess the neutrino could be its own antiparticle. And Majorana said that, and he wrote about it, and then he 
who was a Sicilian guy, he got on a boat in Sicily, a ferry, and he never got off in Rome. <laughs> Nobody knows, but there's a great uh, novella about it. I better go faster, okay. I'm trying to make, sh make you seem, uh, wait, here, here's the point. Physicists are actually interesting. <laughs> Not me, but some other physicists. So anyhow, what happened was Majorana said, oh, if the neutrino, uh, neutrino can be its own anti-neutrino, then a guy at Harvard, amazingly enough, figured out that maybe this kind of diagram where the neutrino is its own anti-neutrino, so in this case, in the normal case that Maria was talking about, two electrons come out and two neutrinos come out, in this case, only two electrons. And why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that because currently there are 10 experiments looking for this neutrinoless double beta decay. So this was 1935 to 2023. What I'm trying to say is things take a long time in particle physics, in all kinds of physics. We're still looking for that. People are still getting money to look for it and the intensity of interest just grows. You know, uh, you're asking why, why Maria Gephardt Mayer? Well, first of all, she wrote a lot of papers by herself, but also she was incredibly intense. And I am a person who has mistaken intensity for depth my whole life. <laughs> and I, I continue to do that. And um, here's the case where she just said, uh, something kind of interesting, she was very interested in, the, in certain lifetimes. So the first time was how fast uh, double beta decay happens. The second one was m much more important. Uh, it, she wanted to know if this is the number of protons of all the isotopes of all the elements there are, and this is the number of neutrons, number of protons. Somehow we know that some of them, these black ones, are very stable. They don't decay quickly. Some others decay very, very quickly. And she was very interested in why, and she figured it out. Um, and that's why she got the Nobel Prize. But what's interesting is the question she was asking. Again, why do some things decay faster than others? Um, the last thing, <laughs> the last thing uh, she did well, it's not the last thing she did, she did it actually first, uh, was with a guy called Edward Teller. And I know you're not Americans, but um, Edward Teller was the father of the hydrogen bomb and, and also the basis of Dr. Strangelove, which probably the young people have never seen. Uh, he, he was a bomb guy. <laughs> a lot of people don't like him, but they were best friends. And they looked at this story and they said, look, take all the elements in the world, let's take uh, hydrogen, nitrogen, iron, zirconium, gold, and let's just measure in the Earth's crust how much there is of it all. And let's just look at that as a function of how many protons there are in that particular element. And let's try and figure out this plot. So they just looked at this plot for a long time, a really long time, and they noticed that after iron, it just drops off. This is a, a log plot, which means if this is a drop normally, it's a bigger drop, <laughs> it's a faster drop. That's what a log means. And all of a sudden they saw that all the stuff after iron, there wasn't very much of it around in the Earth's crust. And what they said was, I guess you know this story. Does everybody know this story? This is one of the most beautiful stories. If this is the periodic table of elements, they suggested that you could not make gold, for instance, in a normal Big Bang, in the dying of low mass stars, in exploding massive stars. No, you could only make this element and all of these purple ones in merging neutron stars. So neutron stars are these very, very dense stars, and only when they smashed into each other 
would you actually make gold? Which is kind of amusing because you have these collisions and then gold is just falling in the universe. And somehow, somehow, we know this is true because just a few years ago, like it's say six years ago, we saw a merging neutron stars in what's called the LIGO experiment. It's a gravitational wave experiment. And they saw a gravitational wave coming from this merger. And then they looked with their telescopes and they saw gold. Kind of cool, no? So what's happening is gold is made and it's in either, you know, just little bunches of gold or just atoms of gold and it's floating in the universe and then gravity pulls it together and makes the earth and then you have gold in the earth the reason why this picture looks a little bit weird is because they don't know exactly how the earth formed <laughs> and they don't know exactly whether the gold was in chunks or was in little pieces but what's kind of cool, like you wear gold somewhere, right? And what's happening is neutron stars collide. They make gold and other things. The gold drifts down. Gravity makes the Earth. The Earth, it goes into the middle, for instance, of the Earth and also uh, the crust. It swirls around crazy hot and makes gold veins and then people mine the gold veins. This is a pretty great picture. Sorry. Is this, okay, I, I think it's a beautiful story. Okay, it's a beautiful story. Another beautiful story is that I went to Maria Geppert Mayer's archive at the University of uh, California, San Diego, and I found 240 letters from Edward Teller to her. Uh, I don't know if you've ever done this, but when you go to an archive, you can get uh, a list of all the first sentences of letters, which I find to be fascinating. I guess I should have been something else. When we talked on the phone today, Monday, I felt like a heel. <laughs> or, I am most conscientiously practicing the art of being lazy. This is Edward Teller, father of the hydrogen bomb. <laughs> all right. um, here we go. It is a year since I wrote to you last and a century since I heard from you. So you read these and you, I actually read all the letters, but you read these and you think, that's really interesting. So that was in San Diego. The next day I drove to, I didn't drive, I lied. I flew to Palo Alto at Stanford at the Hoover Institution where his letters are. His letters, meaning Edward Teller's letters. Um, there was just one letter from Maria Gepper Mayer, which is really sad because I'm much more interested in, I like him, I mean, I like learning about him, but I would be much more interested in, in her. And I gave this talk at a, um, at a big, not this talk, but a, I told this story in a big audience and I asked this question, why, could, why weren't there any letters from her? And then this woman came up to me afterwards, like behind the scenes, like we were behind a curtain. I think there was a curtain and we were behind the curtain. She was an older woman and she said, yes, my, my husband was a friend of Edward Teller and he had a rule, never keep the letters of anyone you've slept with. And I thought, and I just want to say that here, I thought, isn't that too bad? Because who cares whether they slept together? But I'd really like to see those letters. I wonder where they are. Um, sorry, that's usually I thought that would be an interesting point. Was that not interesting? Okay, well, just as another example, I, I think I should actually, it doesn't really matter. Life is just as it is. I, 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 my goal is to make sure that everybody in this room knows who she is and that she's the second woman to win the Nobel Prize in physics. Thomas Kuhn was a very famous guy. When I was a, a, a student here, the structure of the scientific rev revolution came out that ma many of you may have seen somewhere. And this guy, uh, Thomas Kuhn, was the writer. And he interviewed her 
um, he interviewed her in 1962, and it was a really fascinating interview. He just asked about all the men who she'd known when she was a student in Göttingen. He didn't ask a single thing about what she thought about anything. But not that he wasn't a good guy and everything. <laughs> but, geez, I wish. Okay, so enough. You're saying, why did I come here to learn about her? Well, you just had to, because they didn't tell me. They didn't say there were any limits. So here's me again, and I'm going to talk about what I'm working on, and the kind of things I'm interested in and how long they take. This is me uh, here. I know you're thinking it could be that person, but I guess you know that I'm a cowboy because that's what physicists are. And I just want to say that I was a little bit too, you know, wanting to please people, but these ones, these cowgirls, that's what I want to be when I grow up. They could also be my role models. But when I was, uh, uh, when I was a high school student, uh, one of my teachers was a professor at U of T uh, who was a Chinese poetry professor. And I learned a lot about Chinese poetry, and this guy um, is a guy who sits on his horse and looks at the moon and dreams of home. And uh, I sort of adopted this also as my, my own self. I know you're not allowed to anymore. I'm just telling you that. Th that is, um, there's two parts to being a physicist. One is a cowboy who goes over the edge, the edge, whatever horizon that is, and the other one is the one who sits and thinks on his horse, maybe slightly drunk. Okay, so I'm interested in atoms, and uh, we need particle accelerators to do the kind of physics I do, because we're looking at things that are very, very small. I wanted to show you this because this is one of the first colliders. I work at a proton collider. This is one of the first colliders um, that was ever made, and it was made uh, from a photon beam uh, that you, s you hit a, a piece of uh, lead, and an electron and positron came out, and then you collided the electron and positron. And what's interesting about this is it was made by, uh, it was designed by another possible role model, uh, who I want to talk about, Bruno Shushek, one of the favorite accelerator physicists. And one of the things I want to see is that he did write something. So for all the students here, please start writing, because you never know, and you never know. We really want to know what you think. So he said, on the storage ring, that's the storage ring, that's the kind of thing I work on. The following is a very sketchy proposal for this construction of a storage ring in Frascati, that's in Italy. No literature has been consulted in its preparation since this invariably slows down progress in the first stage and necessary though it, it may be in the consecutive stages of the development. I shall present you here all I have thought about and much which others have suggested to me and to anticipate the question, no, I have not properly read O'Neill, but I hope that somebody will. Sorry, I'm just also showing you that physicists are um, interesting. 19, uh, 1954 Geneva, we started uh, digging for an accelerator that will finally um, be close to the one I'm working on right now. Notice that there were these two guys, um, one in a beret, one in a hat, and they're looking at the digger. Um, CERN was sort of, sort of part of the Marshall Plan, adjacent, Marshall Plan adjacent. Um, but look a little more carefully at this picture. I know you think I'm insane. Do you see something else there? These two guys. <laughs> look. Two guys in trench coats looking at the back of two guys in trench coats. It's very odd. <laughs> okay. Um, this is where I work. This is uh, the Mont Blanc. This is the 27 kilometer accelerator, protons hitting protons. It's underground, and the red thing doesn't really exist. That's just to guide the eye. Um, we collide bunches of protons with bunches of protons uh, every 25 nanoseconds, uh, and we do it all the time. And we're trying to find things that are very, very rare and which we don't know whether they exist or not. And a lot of people wonder why we do that. And we also wonder why. 
in the morning, but by evening we're fine. <laughs> in order to do such a thing, you need an incredibly big, obviously 27 kilometer accelerator, but you also need to build a detector so when you collide those two protons, proton, proton, you have to watch what comes out. You have to build a very, very large detector. So these are people, although they're French, but, <laughs> but roughly, roughly normal people. <laughs> oh, that's not a good joke in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a French joke, not a, it's not a French joke. Um, this is where they collide here, but really it's five stories tall. And I can tell you when you have to go up the lift aloft, you should um, be wearing some protection <coughs> if you're scared. So we build a huge detector, but you can't really tell anything. This is sort of what happens. The particles collide here, uh, and this is a cross-sectional view, and particles come out, and our detector has very, it's like an onion, and it has very many layers, and we can tell what kind of particles come out. So this is the kind of thing that happens without the pink thing, <laughs> okay? So we have a big magnetic field. When charged particles go through it, the particles bend. We're able to measure its momentum. But what we're interested in in this case, because we've, we've, ar we've already found the Higgs boson, so there's nothing else to do, we're looking for something which perhaps travels this far and then decays. And when we say, oh, what is that? That could be a totally new particle. And this is a new way of thinking because normally, so this is just another view. This is, the primary, this is the vertex where everything happens, where the protons collide. A particle comes out and then decays. So if we measure this distance, we can tell how long it lasted. And this is the kind of thing we normally do. We make a top quark, which we love. And after a while, the top quark decays into a W and a bottom quark. Let's just say this happens. It does. This top quark decays in 10 to the minus 24 seconds. OK, how small is that? So if light goes across a proton, that's how long does that take? It takes less than 10 to the minus 24 seconds. So. This decays really fast. This decays really fast. This one we can see. We're very happy about that. We spend all our time looking at it. So we are interested in, can we look for new particles and then get a Nobel Prize by finding particles with different lifetimes than any particle we've seen before? So can we collide our protons? A new particle comes out. It decays. Can we just? measure this distance and that time and figure out if we found a new particle. This is not what we normally do. What we normally do is we say, let's look at all the particles, let's see their decay, let's look at the decay products, and let's calculate the mass of the particle. And it looks like this. And we go, this is really nice, because this is a bump, and we're bump hunters. If you just want to look at the lifetime here, it's going to look, remember, the, remember what we said? It's going to look like this. And then you say, that's awful. I don't want to do that. I feel sad. And then you go home. Does that make sense? But that's what we're going to do. OK. So we've already found a bunch of particles. <laughs> um, and I won't talk about them much, other than to say there are six quarks. There aren't any more, so don't get your hopes up if you're young. There are six leptons. Pretty much same thing. Uh, there's a Higgs boson. We found that. And there's these forces. So if you're a young person, you need to come up with some pretty new ideas, um, which is why it's an exciting thing to do. So here's the one plot. And you're going to go, why am I looking at this? Here's particle mass. So these top quark, the Higgs boson up here, they have really, really high mass. And they have really, really, this is the lifetime, really, really tiny lifetimes. This is, a, this is a millionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second. And then there are some particles like the electron that don't decay. And so there's an arrow. Or the proton, hopefully, doesn't decay. The neutron decays in 17 minutes. And then there's a whole bunch of particles we spent a lot of time looking at and finding. 
And we know when they decay. We know that their mass is small, but their lifetime is something we can actually measure in our detector. So now we're looking here. We're looking here at things that are very high mass, but with lifetimes somewhere that we can measure. Except for this man here, who's looking for things that are high mass and over here. Is that right? Yeah. But I'm not looking over there. Because with my detector, I can just look here. And you may say, why do I care? And I can say, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know. So the point is that we can imagine, we imagine, we imagine that what could happen is that two protons interact and make two gluinos. They don't exist, but we can imagine. And those gluinos decay at some point after a while into some quarks and some neutral enos. There's a lot of eno thing going around, like Brian eno. And we can say, this might happen. And then we say, does it happen? And you say, no, it doesn't. But if it did happen, for every quark, there'd be a squark. And for every lepton, there'd be a slepton. <laughs> I know, physicists are a little bit silly. So looking for something like in here could lead us to a whole new force, new particles, new ideas about physics. Uh, this is what a huge number of us are spending our time doing, but we haven't found any. OK, so you're saying to yourself, what the hell? Oh, heck. What the heck? A lot of time. Um, when you're doing these things and you spend like, I just spent the past six years looking for particles that last a certain amount of time and didn't find any. And you think, am I a physicist? This is usually before coffee. <laughs> Often a lot of things we do are not things that you would think a physicist does. What do you think a physicist does? How about you guys? Bored? I know. I know that. I'm sorry that you're bored. That's really good. Do you think your dad has a lizard brain? So the lizard brain we know is the part of your brain, you know, it's really old. And then there's the monkey brain part, right? There's also a physics brain. Did you know that? And just by being his daughter, it could be a problem. The thing about the physics brain, <laughs> the, th the thing about the physics brain is this. As soon as you start studying physics after about the first two classes, it starts growing. And every time you look at something, you start thinking like a physicist, like, how long does it last? How high is it? How big is it? What's it made out of? Well, that's a harder one. And this is your mouth. But there's also another question you can ask, which is, how long does the physics brain last? So how long can you call yourself a physicist? So lots of you youngsters are physicists because you have a physics brain. And until that physics brain goes away, I'm not sure it's right there. <laughs> it could be, could be lower. Um, until that physics brain goes away, you won't know. So it's really interesting to know how long it lasts. Um, Apparently, if you give a test to physics students before they take a class, and then after, they do better after. But if you wait a year after that, they do the same as they did before. <laughs> so I think this is a really interesting problem. Um, and I don't know why I'm telling you about that, but I think it's important for all the physics students to know that you're already physicists. And for anybody else who's ever taken a physics course, it could be true also. Um, the last thing I want to say is I went to, uh, I don't know where this is, Oxford. And there's this beautiful natural history museum there. It's really, really beautiful. And it has these amazing uh, formaldehyde smell <laughs> in it. I don't know if it's formaldehyde. It's that stuff that the museums smell of. And there's these statues all around this courtyard. There's statues of great scientists. And um, 
they look something like this. <laughs> and I just, this is Mar uh, Maria, Gebert Mary. And I just, when I was in there, I was thinking, wow, just think how many hundreds of years women didn't do science. And like, they were probably just sitting around with little physics brains going, <laughs> I don't know what to do with my life. And they, after coffee, they just did something else, I guess. But just think about all that, uh, all those people like Maria or me, who could have been using our little physics brains so happily. Anyhow, that's why I wanted to tell you about her. I did actually think about cutting off the head, because a lot of these guys are just nobody just like some guy who gave money for something or something. We could have cut off his head um, and put her, but I just, this is why I wanted to tell you, and I hope that something I said, one thing I said might have um, made you feel happy and, and slightly bored. Because if I can bore you really, really well, better than anybody else, although I notice you're not asleep, Your dad bores you more? <laughs> you're, qu you're, you're, that's, yep. <laughs> yep. I'm really sorry to have bored you, but I'm willing to give you 10 bucks if you'll shut up. <laughs> it was a joke. Thank you very much. Yeah. So you have a microphone. Okay, yeah. Cool. <clears throat> Anybody who wants to leave, please, please leave now. Um, <clears throat> okay. Thanks for this um, for this awesome talk, Melissa. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna take a couple of pages out of your book next okay. time I give a talk. This is much better than the usual thing. Um, so. I guess, okay, I'm supposed to start with a question of my own, and I have so many, okay. but um, I'm going to start with one that fits the tone. So you mentioned early on that there was, that, um, that Göttingen was this weird nexus of physics. Do you think there's anything like that today, or is it just, is, is, has that age passed? Do we not have these nexuses of, of strangely concentrated progress? Right. Do you, do, you, do you think that that, that ship well, is Well, of sailed? course, there's University of Toronto. Of course. Um, no, it, there's been a diaspora. Yeah. There's many, many more places where people are, and there's no, there's really good people everywhere. It's yeah. weird, yeah. Yeah. Do Do you think? Do you think? You know. So, one thing that may that one thing that you didn't mention, but historically, the 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 North America and Europe kind of took turns building the biggest collider. North America would build one, and then. Europe would build the bigger one, and, and there's this old joke that certain kinds of particles, they are called fermions, get discovered in, in, uh, in North America, and the bosons get discovered in, in Europe. Do you, think, do you think we'll get another one on this side of the pond um, at any point, or, or are we just doomed to neutrino experiments? Um, no, no, we're, we're, uh, we're designing uh, a muon collider. Mm. Muons only last... Uh, two microseconds. So it's a weird thing to design a collider of two beams of particles that only last two microseconds. But that's what we're doing. And when we do that, will we find a new particle? We'll have a new collider. And um, that'll be in about, um, you'll be 40. That's so kind no, of you. No, the no. Board, the board girl oh, yeah. will be 40. That's right. Uh, you just look straight past and, me. And we'll, I'll be dead. <laughs> I'll be dead. <laughs> I'll be dead. And yeah. yeah. So that's, uh, yes. We have, the U.S. doesn't have a good constitution. <laughs> full, full stop. Yeah, okay. <laughs> For, uh, so, so the U.S., w w we started making a huge collider, but you have to get... Um, authorization every year from Congress. And Congress just doesn't have that kind of... I think they're growing mushrooms on the old one down in Texas. Yeah, they are, yeah. yeah they That's are. sad, yeah. Um, you can get superconducting super collider mushrooms in Texas because they have to put something into that $2 billion half tunnel. Um, yeah. Um, look, I, th I think I, I want to open the floor to the audience, but I want to... That's your last question? 
Oh, I have. <laughs> oh, do I get more? I, I feel like I'm being greedy. Like I feel like I'm being greedy. They, okay. 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 Um, so I guess you know, it, I was I was very I was very pleased to see that that you've been one of the people that are looking for for long lived particles, um, and and for these kinds of um, possible new states. Um, do you think h how optimistic are you about success, g given given where the, you know the Large Hadron Collider um, has you know 15 years, 20 years of, of left, and the detectors are if. I, and, and not, not to make this too technical, but it's it's a pretty tough job to like sift up to sift these decays out of the data. Yeah. Um, how 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 are you feeling about it? Do you think there's a lot of ground left to cover, um, or or are we sort of just at the grindstone now? No, no. I think uh, I think. Well, first of all, you came up with an experiment that's pretty that's good. That's true. I, did. I yeah, like but, that. But idea. this isn't this is about you, not about. No, me. no, no. It is. It is because I'm excited by those kind of things. So um, we had our detector where we make particles and then we look for things we can measure the, the length of. But if you imagine something has a really long lifetime, you could put a detector on top of the Earth, you know, where that red line was for the accelerator, and just look for things that are really long-lived, which is what you're involved in. I don't know. I think we're going to find something. We always feel like we're in a desert, but I like that feeling of the desert with the cigarette and the alcohol and the, and the, and the you know, sweating. I like that. I, d I don't think it's over. It's honest work. It's oh, not. I agree. It's not over. <laughs> it's not over. I think it's going to be very, very exciting. And I think the I think that generation, the people I'm looking at, when you're about 50, you're just going to go, wow, like it totally blew me away. I think that's what's going to happen. But it might not be next year. You might be. It might be too gone for you. It. it, it I, I feel like I have like a little tiny chance of making it. The, yeah. the, the timelines are getting longer and longer with each new discovery, but. I think that makes this a noble profession, to be honest with you. A lonely? A noble profession. Oh, noble. I think it is noble. Nobel. I, I, Your Highness. Oh, just by the way, just in case you want oh, to know. Like, I, I work with 3,000 physicists, so how many combinations of three, with three people can win the Nobel Prize, how many combinations of three among 3,000? So sorry, that we're never going to get the Nobel Prize. I just want you to know that when we discovered the top quark, which we did in America, the president of the United States, who normally calls the winner, the winners of the Super Bowl when they win, did not call us. And we didn't get the Nobel Prize because there's too many of us. We didn't get any prizes. Just thought I'd let you know that in case. <laughs> in case. <laughs> no, I think it's fine. I mean, is, is this the same president that canceled the Super Collider? Well, the president doesn't cancel the super collider. Well, that's true. Yeah. As Congress does, yeah. No, no, no president ever called us. I am, I am sorry about that. No, no, it's I fine. I think you deserve a phone call. It's fine. I think you deserve a phone call. <laughs> it's fine. Um, I, I, li I liked one of the audience submitted questions that people submitted questions before they. Uh, I like. Sorry, I liked them all. They were great, but uh, I liked one. I liked one in particular, um, and it almost seems redundant after your talk. But I do want to get you to elaborate. Uh, what, what do you, you know, the, the exact question was, what do you believe that you think few, very few or no other physicists believe? And, and I think that's an interesting question. Uh, what do I believe? Because there's lots of ways in which we're united by the ways, that, the things that we believe and how we do our jobs. What do you believe that you think no other physicist believes? Fountain of youth? Oh, oh, so uh, oh really? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the question was, oh, good. The question was, uh, what do you believe that you think no other physicist believes? What is a unique physics belief of you? You want to uh, What do I believe? It's a tough question. Yeah. But a good one. That no other physicist believes. Or, or that few other physicists believe. A hot take. I think we're. I think we're after a hot take. Something spicy. Spicy. If you can, if you can swing that. Okay, I'll, I'll give one. I, I believe, and I think this is not what many people believe, that in a natural world, where natural is defined however way you want it, there would be just as many women physicists as men physicists. I think I, think I can agree with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's what I think so. So that might be, there's another question that we can 
build on that. Someone wanted to ask you, obviously, you know, as the first woman who got tenure at Harvard, um, well, you know, what was that like? What kind of shit did you have to put up with? Nothing, really. It was just, oh. it was br a breeze. That, not that. You know, the nice thing about Harvard, uh, this isn't recorded, right? <laughs> The nice thing about I would Harvard like to know the answer to this question. is that pr people are pretty uh, confident in their own abilities. So I'm not really a threat to anyone. So they, everyone's just been incredibly nice to me. Sort of. I mean, that's yeah. wonderful, yeah. Um, Okay, I, I, could, I could monopolize her um, for the rest of the day, but I think it's only fair to open up questions. So um, why don't we start with the bearded gentleman? And I think we have runners. Yes, excellent. Okay. You do have to hold it quite close to your mouth, I'm told. So, uh, so, so um, you... Closer. So you talked about the idea of a physics brain. Yep. And uh, other people have talked about... Uh, so you, you're, you're talking about uh, an identity of the physics... Yeah. A physicist who has a brain, and um, and you just recently talked about the problem of why there's not very many or not enough uh, women uh, physicists. So, to what extent is the idea of the physics or the physicist, as we've been practicing it for the last um, 50 or 100 years, a, a creation like gender, <laughs> or you know that is, is it socially constructed? This idea of of being able to to construct a, uh, from observations an understanding of the world. Is that gendered? Is that it, it, well, no, that, that's what I mean. It's a social construction. It, it, it was, it, it's uh, the idea of the Victorians who tried to create this idea of the, the, the genius from oh. which uh, um, you know, our, our understanding of the world was not c produced by a, 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 a document or by a, a priest cult, it was created by the person, the great man. So to what extent is that a social construction? Yeah, I remember reading a book called The so Con Social Construction of What, right. uh, which was written by a U of T professor, basically saying social construction was n not real. <laughs> um, but I, but I could, but I, I do, so I don't know an answer to your question, but I can tell you something which I found really interesting. Um, there are a lot of young women who are incredibly good at physics who don't end up doing physics. And I talked to one of them recently, um, and I said, what is it? And she said, when I come to a physics class, you know, when I go to a class in the humanities, I bring all of me to that class, my whole self. But when I come to a physics class, I just bring the physics part because I don't, I don't feel confident bringing my whole self. And so it's kind of a weird idea, but the point is that it's not fun enough for women in physics right now because physics is a really rough sport. It's much worse than hockey. I mean, not only do you whip the puck up in someone's head, it's, you do it really fast. Like someone says, I think I have an idea, and someone immediately says, you're wrong. That's the way it works. Like, it's really rough. And it's rough in a way that's not fun. And it's rough in a way that it doesn't need to be also. Apparently, math is not rough. But it... No, no, apparently, I said. <laughs> All I'm saying is, it, you know... I don't know whether it's socially constructed, I, I don't know, but it has to be some place you want to spend the rest of your life. So I see an enormous number of really, really smart young women doing something else, something like s economics or, or, you know. Our losses, their gain. So, I don't know, I, yeah. Um. Anyone else uh, want to? Okay. Um, <laughs> one, and two, like one, two. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm going randomly. Sorry. Let's start with you, and then there, there was lots of pointing in that direction. Sorry, buddy. You didn't have enough support, apparently. So I just wanted to say I, I completely agree, agree with you that in, in the natural world, half of physicists would be women. Um, but actually, I wanted to ask you something since you're here. When I first started at U of T in the 80s, 
I knew some grad students in physics, and there was a rumor about you. And, a, and it was that you were offered a, a job here before you went to Harvard, and that you got on the elevator, and one of the physics professors, some jerk, said something mean to you in the elevator, and then, and then you, went, you turned us down and went to Harvard. I'm just wondering if that's true. Yeah, that's a little bit of an understatement. Okay, I, I think we'd all like to hear that story, actually. I, I really don't think you want to hear that story. I think U of T's moved on, possibly. Um, I just, I'll give one anecdote of many. It wasn't an elevator. The professor invited me into his office and said, we both know you're not any good. I just want you to know that now. Jesus. So it was, I'd say, I was surprised. But I think it was what you would call an abusive relationship. It wasn't just, that was a kind of theme. There was a theme going around. Um, but I think they, they're probably right. <laughs> you know, everybody does their part. I mean, everybody, I think about in science, like, you don't have to be particularly smart or anything like that. You just have to really be interested in, and work hard. And I think he, he did. Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with him. I mean, he wasn't, you know, the funniest guy in the world. I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that was a long time ago, and I think, um, hopefully, the the physics department oh, at U of T is, is the chair is now a woman, right? But I mean, we, we have a long way to go. But yeah, you know. but there were no women then. Hmm. Yeah, that's okay. There, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think let's go with you. Um, Oh well, we'll do him. We'll do him next. Let's do the. He's been waiting for it. Yeah, with the stripy scarf. No worries. Um, so I was wondering, kind of building off of a previous question, how do we make physics more fun? Um, like I like I I, I too, I've been tutoring for a long time, and I eventually want to be a professor, and I want to make physics like my classroom, my hypothetical future classroom, you know, a fun place to learn. You know, it's funny, I know this is going to sound weird, but I think the way you make physics fun is to talk about physics all the time. To actually talk about physics in a fun way. Like, immerse yourself in it so that it's intense and crazy like Maria Gepert Mare, but also make it creative for everybody. You, it's amazing. Some people are able to do that, and if you can set that tone, it becomes fun for everyone. If you set the other tone, like, we're just checking to see whether you're good enough to do physics, nobody wants to do it. So, yeah, I think just talking constantly about physics in all kinds of goofy ways, like say everything you think and not worry about whether people think you're an idiot. I, obviously, I don't. That, that, that's what I've noticed. Have you noticed that? I mean, I have high hopes that there is some on generational scales that there is some improvement that these like hyper arrogant assholes of old uh, do no longer get to set the tone unequivocally although there oh, is still excuse me the hyper arrogant whatever you said asshole yeah <laughs> that's not something of old no 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 sorry <laughs> absolutely not <laughs> absolutely not <laughs> that's not something but, of but, old that's a that's, that's a constant of nature that's that sort is, of like alpha electromagnetic that is something that is something we could measure to one part and ten to the twenty-fifth. <laughs> that's that's absolutely true. Yeah. But but I but I think they got away with more back then, and they and they were questioned less, and their genius was venerated without question more, and they got to do whatever whatever the hell they wanted. And there's there is more pushback and more setting of okay. um, these days. Th that is that is my idiosyncratic. Okay, hope. I think the young people have to be real physics warriors in the sense of. Let's talk about whatever we want. Let's be creative and say things that might be ridiculous, like his idea, sorry, his idea could have been ridiculous, the, this one of it putting a, a detector a on top of the idea. earth, far away from, from the, the accelerator. 
I, I think that's the way to do it. I don't think you can ever get rid of, you can isolate, a, a, you can isolate those people. <laughs> this guy didn't get to ask the question. Sorry. Well, no, but he did. Uh, oh, we'll do you next. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Just an anecdote um, on the fun part. Um, uh, you mentioned finding gold in space. Wouldn't yeah. it be fun to find unknown elements in space? Yeah. And then a question. Um, um, I, I was looking for more information on the uh, muon G-2. Is there any hint from LHC on, on it? Um, so so G-2 is a measurement of the muon um, moment. And um, it was measured to be slightly different than, or but statistically different than the theory. This has been going on, on for a long time where the theorists get something wrong, and then the experiments get something wrong, and then the theorists get something right, and the experiments get something right. So we won't really know because there's only one experiment um, right now. We won't really know for a while. But we do know that there was a really great thing that happened at CERN that looked like the muon and the electron were very different. And then they just forgot to check something, like the steam valve, <laughs> the flay rod. <laughs> yeah, so, so far there's, there's little hints of new physics everywhere, but no big ringer. So we don't know. And we won't for a while. But but a while here is shorter than the other timelines, right? Like a few right. years, kind yes. of five it's years. It's not 10 yeah. to the it's 17 not, years. It's not 20 or, or 10 to the 17, yeah. yeah. Maybe in five years, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, gen the neglected gentleman in front, I'm so sorry. Oh, uh, let's, the mic. Let's get him wait, on. Wait, wait. Hang on, wait for the mic, wait for the mic. Right there, right there. Ah. Uh. Initially, I was going to ask serious questions, but uh, obviously this is a different kind of, <laughs> of uh, talk. So I will ask a, a joke question. Uh, you were talking about uh, about brain of physicists, but you haven't given any um, differentiation between different physicists. So uh, what, is your, oh. what is your opinion on differentiation between uh, brain of experimental physicists and uh. brain of theoretical physicists? <laughs> well... Yeah, I have a, I have a, so um, I once went to dinner after a talk with some physicists, some theorists, when I was very young, and one of the theorists told me about his view of experimentalists versus theorists. So you probably know about truffles and how you find truffles. There's farmers and they have pigs. And they sort of know where the, they sort of, <laughs> the pigs, <laughs> they sort of know where, <laughs> where, the, where the truffles are roughly, but not exactly. So they take the pigs to a part of the forest where they think there are truffles, and then the pigs snuffle out the truffles, and then the farmer comes with a big stick and hits the pig and takes the truffle. <laughs> And he said, this is the relationship between theorists, the farmers, and experimentalists, the pigs. <laughs> and because of that, I thought, I am never reading another theoretical paper. <laughs> Which really kept me really back for a while. But it isn't true. I think the mind of the experimentalist is very different than the mind of the theorist. You do? I do. I think it, some theorists think they're experimentalists, but until you actually build a detector and you have that feeling, it's not so easy to build particle detectors. I don't know. It's not like you can just, like Ikea, you know, where you have a thing, <laughs> you have a, like a description. Or It's not even like Ikea without the instructions. It's nothing like Ikea. <laughs> it's sort of like you got to have to be interested in figuring stuff out and solving problems that are physical and electrical and electronic. And most theorists just don't have the patience or the ability. I, I can or, confirm this to yeah. be 100% true, yes. Yeah, and so I think there, I don't know what's actually, I think we should do some fMRI uh, studies of the brain, physics brain in the two. But um, 
they're, they're very different, and, but they're nicely complementary once in a while. There are some theorists who had great experimental brains. Steven Weinberg, for instance. Um, Ed Witten, actually. Ed Witten, well. really? He invented the dark matter dark detector, the scattering, back before he went off and reinvented math. Like, he's a, anyway. Ed Witten's a very tall guy. With a very, very, very large forehead. Very tall guy. I don't believe this story at all. No, it's actually true. Well, okay. No, he, he in, <laughs> Wait, about the forehead or about the dark matter? No, no, I, I believe he has a large forehead. <laughs> <laughs> accident when Polly appears uh, near to a uh, laboratory of physics, that they blow. They, there was such talk that uh, when Polly passed through some city, I can't remember which. It blows which, up. Yeah. So that's the reason that it, that it blew? <laughs> um, there are all kinds of stories that are really interesting about, even about among experimental physicists where the boss wants to come in and touch everything but doesn't really know how. So they build, uh, on some experiments, they build a second setup, like a second control room so that the boss can come in and switch things and no nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> because so it's even there's all kinds of hierarchies of experimental. I, th I think it's inf incredibly nice that we have both. There's a question over there. Oh, okay, let's get a microphone. Sorry, microphone, if that's okay. All right. Uh, my question is about the uh, how is this going to change our life? So, for example, classical physics uh, tells you do not sit under a tree on a blustery day during harvest time. Uh, is the, it, what can this change about our life? Well, I don't know what you think. I, I, I mean, this, this, is your, this is your pony show. I, I really, I so for instance, one of the things we did just a while back, maybe 10 years back, was discover something called the Higgs boson. And by discovering the Higgs boson, we discovered that if you take all of the matter out of the universe, there's energy there. And that energy has a particular form. And by making the Higgs boson, which is just somehow exciting that energy, we were able to understand that energy. And let's just say, you're saying, I don't care. Then we said, oh, goodbye, board, board people. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you, young lady. Um, we said, oh, it turns out we can tell whether or not we are in a stable universe, a metastable universe, or an unstable universe. Now, you may not think that matters, but if it's unstable, <laughs> if, if, if the universe is unstable, we're not talking about the Earth, we're talking about the entire universe, then that might be something you want to know. Now, doesn't... I will say that there's not much we can do about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But you might want to know it, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I think you want to know. No, I agree, obviously. The, vacu the vacuum of the universe is probably the most interesting thing to me. And if I, you know, if I didn't have to look for long-lived particles, I would definitely try and measure that better. Because it, it, it sort of, it is the definition of everything. I mean, if you think you can explain and describe with equations the universe with nothing in it, you're done. I'm actually, then I could just retire. You know, I, I have an incredibly mechanical answer to your question, by the way, like, which I like to tell people when they ask me that precise question, because I have no idea what's going to happen in 200 years, okay? And I don't claim to... I don't claim that it's plausible or not plausible that we'll manipulate certain energies or whatever, but two or three hundred years ago, people were zapping frog legs with, you know, batteries made from oranges. And what they were doing is using the best available technology at the time to push around the only fundamental particle that they could dislocate, which was called the electron. And by pushing around the electron, however they did, they noticed it did strange things to matter that they had access to, frog legs and things like that. And then 300 years later, it's everything, right? Like, and if you asked someone who was well, some of those French people that were like twitching fro frog legs in the 1700s or whatever with their orange batteries, if you asked them what they thought that would lead to, they would never. It was some bizarre 
bourgeois curiosity uh, of, of, of these like feed scientists. But 300 years later, it's, 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 it's power, it's transistors, it's computation. It's unimaginable frontiers. Wait, wait, uh, effete? Effete scientists? Uh, anyway, the point is that... <laughs> uh, see, the German in me doesn't know how to pronounce these things properly. No, no, but, that's pronounced right. But, uh, okay. So the point is that, you know, I have not the faintest idea what it's good for, but neither did those people back 300 years ago when they were zapping frog legs. You, you know, know? I, don't, I don't think this works, actually. Really? Okay, good. Let's do this. Yeah. Well, because we're... Those were electrons. Those are very sure, useful. Sure, sure. We're looking at things that are... <laughs> M much smaller. Uh, you know, but if we discover long-lived particles, they yeah. might be good for all kinds of things. For what? If you have a long-lived particle that you can make and it's reliably got a lifetime of 10 meters, it's, uh, you know, there's, 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 there's it's a completely new class of phenomena where something's invisible and suddenly it appears. And I don't know, like, all I'm saying is, who knows what, in okay. principle... You but might wouldn't it be it. a better argument? Your argument is very good. But that's, that's, could you that's, add? I feel insulted. But could yeah, you okay. add? To, could, could you, could you I feel add? Like I'm, I feel like I'm being handled. No, no, no. I, I went to one of those courses. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, I can tell. No, no. <laughs> you come prepared. No. Um, don't you think it's? Uh, I think that maybe this is true. We don't know. A lot of the things, a lot of the applications, come much, much later. There are certainly, like, for instance, the electronics we build is much faster than any electronics that in order to measure these very small times we have to do very very complicated things it's much faster than any electronics that anybody's using so we're pushing that but you say that's uh, i don't care what do i care about electronics you know what you care about you care to live in a society where people are constantly asking questions and trying to answer them because otherwise society doesn't seem very i could be wrong here everybody's looking at me like i'm completely wrong I think I want to live in a world where people are pushing the frontiers no matter, in all directions. I think we're inc we are lucky because humans are curious and we don't want to lose that curiosity. That is like just gold, but it's not from neutron star mergers. But I think that's why. I think that we want to, I, even people who I don't like, like someone was going to say, I thought you were going to say, can you tell the difference between a condensed matter physicist and a, <laughs> and a particle physicist? There are lots of people I don't particularly like, but I really want them to keep on searching and being curious in science. And I think that makes my life better, but I could be wrong. No, I mean, I completely agree. Um, did you pour that for me? I did. You're so nice. You're welcome. Um, I mean, I, I completely agree. I would also just, you know, the way that I kind of justify that in, in a utilitarian sense, it is a version of that stupid frog leg story where the, <laughs> the reason why... Was you know, that Faraday? Who was the frog leg story? Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. Los yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, yeah. but, but, you know, you want a thousand scientists working on their own little thing because you don't know who's going to strike gold and you don't know what's going to move the field forward. And, and, and in fact, in particle physics for a long time, especially theorists have been very guilty of, of claiming to predict their discoveries which is a sin of, of my, my, my theoretical forefathers, but, um, but not one that most other, not one that we should actually reasonably claim in science. You want to have a, you want to have a thousand people working on the anthill and one of them will strike and then you go from there. And you want them to be wild for the young people. Right, yeah, yeah, you definitely want to be wild. Yeah. That's correct. Um, yeah. Let's, let's get your question. Let's get a mic over here, right there. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. One and then two. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, my question is for Melissa. Um, when your male colleagues, uh, physicists, um, struck down your, uh, or ignored, st tried to strike down or second guess your um, theories um, concerning uh, the physics that you were doing, uh, which I'm doing, how did you overcome that? How did you... Um, uh, get around the fact that there, I know there are men out there who are not happy with a, f a woman being a physicist and they will do everything they can to undermine her, strike down those theories, and uh, just simply uh, second guess you. How did you overcome that and how did you get them to, to agree or make them understand that your theories uh, concerning the physics that you were doing were, uh, were, were, right, on, were right on the money? 
They, um, so, so thank you for that question. They, they weren't actually saying that my theories weren't any good. Um, not that I had a lot of theories. They were saying that I wasn't any good. And they were saying that, you know, the typical things. Um, you're not very good, you're not very good. You're not very good. They kept saying that. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm glad the kids are gone. Um, because I, I learned to do this. And I don't advise this, but I just learned to say, fuck off. Sorry, not to you, sorry. Um, and they're always very startled by that kind of thing. Or you can just hit them. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I, I, you can, you know. All of us, I mean, scientists are not usually very smart. But we try hard. And we're always asking ourselves these ridiculous questions like, am I smart enough? Which is a really, really, really ridiculous question and a total waste of time. The only question you can really ask is, am I interested enough to keep doing this? And if you are, then you do it. Um, so this idea of smart is kind of weird. I think, I think I haven't said fuck off in a long time. I mean, I have definitely said fuck off in a long time to a colleague. So I think things are getting better. Well, I would say something like, fuck off and get out of my office. <laughs> so I don't really know how they took it. They left. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, no, no, I totally do. And I don't tell them to say, just so you know, I don't advise them to say fuck off um, because it's not, it's not right. Um, I think you, that's the kind of thing you do just if you don't have a lot of time. I do think it's okay to say fuck off every now and then. Um, but no, no, I, I think, um, honestly, I, I think that the reason that women aren't going into physics is as much as they should or would, could, is that they hear that sometimes, and they don't think they're not smart enough, but they just don't feel like listening to that stuff. So that's too bad. I, uh, I was once working with some graduate students a long time ago, and we were doing Venn diagrams on the, on the whiteboard. Uh, we were trying to see what kind of peop people, what set of people would marry a female particle physicist who is over five foot 11. <laughs> we came up with a really small set. Or, or even, <laughs> I know that was very funny. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know why that came to mind. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I think that young women, or at least, you know, I teach at a place where the women are ridiculously smart. Much, much smarter than me. It makes me very happy. But then it makes me really, really upset when they leave, so. I don't know what the answer is. He seems to think it's men changing. Uh, well, or getting getting away, getting away with less bullshit, yes, which yeah. is a good thing. Yeah. So bullshit just goes, you know, when bullshit doesn't smell anymore, it just goes underneath. It smells when it goes underneath. That's a fair point. Yeah. yeah. That's a fair. I don't point. know what it's going underneath. The Earth's crust, possibly. Let's talk about really fun things. Uh, there, was a, there was a question. Uh, yep. Uh, the lady over there. Someone get a microphone right there. Oh, yeah, put your arm up. That, that's right. Someone can find you. I was going to ask in relation to Harriet Brooks and how she got married and died, but I'm more interested in your opinion. Um, with regards to 
females going out of physics to do other things. I was thinking of it in relation to women getting in relationships and getting distracted. How inefficient do you think love and, let's say, desire is, and how corruptive is it to a analytical mindset? Are you asking me, should you ever fall in love? Oh, that's the question we're here for. Are well, you? I, <laughs> uh, is that, is, well, are you married? No, I don't actually like marriage. I, re- I used to read Thomas Hardy as a, young, a youngster, and Thomas Hardy really had a... He really had a clear view of why people get married and I decided I didn't want to do that however I don't think it's marriage that ruins it here's what I can tell you as an experimentalist (laughs) or maybe as a data analyst all women particle physicists who got married to non scientists got divorced And all women particle physicists who married scientists did not get divorced. I actually didn't know that. Yes. And the reason is that, and this is an incredible, ridiculous statement, but I'm just saying it's empirical, that a lot of times spouses, either one, doesn't matter whether it's a man or woman. Spouses don't understand why you'd rather be in the lab or you'd rather be thinking about physics than doing something with them. And only other scientists can really understand that. So what my, I would, I think you should definitely fall in love, sex, the whole thing, marriage, whatever you want, with someone who's a scientist. <laughs> And not just like sort of a scientist. Like you really want one that wakes up in the morning and just starts studying. Is that helpful? You don't want a normal guy, even if he's cute. Better have the not cute guy who's not normal. Thank you. Was that helpful? I had the same inkling, but it's good to hear it from you. (laughs) Uh, more questions like that? Please. I think we're running out oh, of time. Good. We're running out of time. Oh, boo. Maybe one last question? One last question. Um, okay, yeah, Hi. over here. <laughs> Hi. I thought you were going to comment more about Thomas Kuhn, and maybe if you had more time, you'd give us two or three stories. And I'm curious, when's the next paradigm coming? Or paradigm well, shift? It, so it turns out that was wrong. Turns out um, there is no... The structure of scientific... There are no paradigm shifts. No, no, no. It turns out he was wrong, and he okay. even he even agreed. Um, but it was a good it was a good book. It's a good story. All well, the, good stories are not. So exactly we need the right. errata for that book. We need yeah. the corrections. Uh, curious. Instead yeah. of the male female uh, discussion, uh, we, I'm asking about three other uh, problems. Uh, when we look at physicists and we and the layperson tries to learn about it, I'm thinking about funding bias institutional bias, insider, outsider bias. And uh, when do you welcome outsiders to at least entertain what they have to say if they're somewhat coherent or, and even if they're wrong, it's nice to mix up ideas uh, and entertain them, right? To find a synthesis of new ideas. So to what extent does your community entertain the outsiders or people who aren't funded or people who are Right, Left that's a out. really good question. There's a lot of outsiders, which is really nice. There's a lot of people thinking about stuff and coming up with their own theories. One of the things I have a lot of problem with is when someone sends you their theory, which often ends, tends to be long, it's really, they know a lot. It's really hard to find the deep mistake. It, 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 it takes many hours. Yeah, I guess, can, you know, they, I don't know why. I mean, usually when it's a new theory, like, that, you know, you can just generate energy from nothing, like something like that. You know, someone, a lot, you know, physicists are almost always on the verge of craziness. You know that? Like, when they think, when we think we've discovered something new, we get nuts, completely nuts. And that's a kind of normal thing. First of all, we're very intense, then we go nuts. 
<laughs> you feel and so, so I think that I think the the people, the outsiders, also also have that same feeling. Like they start working on something and they think they have a new theory and they think it explains everything, and they go kind of nuts, a little nuts, like a little, like very, what's the word? Manic. And so when they're writing, it's hard to to really follow it exactly. Sometimes do you fear discussing with your colleagues for two reasons, uh, embarrassment and oh. also secrecy because you're competing with them? No, I don't. No? We, there's no secrecy. Uh, I do want to make a comment about the 50-50 between male and female. One person commented, you commented. It actually doesn't have to be 50-50 and it doesn't have to be in favor of the males. Given, given how women are out keep competing males today, y you could make an argument that m more than 50% of people should be physicists. But I'm just saying, to, to say 50-50, it's kind of like a political yeah. statement, right? Thanks. I'm Thanks just saying what you're saying. Okay, anyway. Great, thank you. Do you want to Appreciate comment? it. No, I, so, just, I, I do want to comment oh. on one thing. Thomas Kuhn once threw an ashtray at a friend of mine's head. <laughs> That's all. That's it. All right, thank you, Melissa. Thomas Kuhn. So, so before, before you all go, Sorry, I didn't want to cut off. I really do want to thank Melissa for a, a very great talk. But here at Innis, we always give the last word to a student. And so I'd like to invite Ray up. Sorry. Sorry. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Raya. Oh. Testing, yeah, okay. Um, hi, my name is Raya. I'd like to first thank everyone for coming out tonight. Especially after last year's online focus, it's wonderful to see such a large turnout despite the rain. Here at Innis, we're fortunate to have such a program that maintains connections with our alumni, and I'd like to thank Professor Franklin for her phenomenal lecture. My first exposure to particle physics was in fifth grade, when the news of the Higgs boson discovery swept the world. A professor at the local university was giving a public presentation about the discovery, and my father, the science enthusiast that he is, delightedly dragged my sister and I to the talk. As expected for a 10-year-old attending a lecture intended for a post-secondary school audience, 98% of the lecture went over my head. The 2% I did retain, though, was the notion that the sciences, and especially particle physics, is an incredibly intricate discipline. It was this feeling that Professor Franklin again invoked within me this evening. The absence of supersymmetric particles, learning about the nuances of beta decay, and the foundations of isotope stability all speak to a profoundly innovative subject. And hearing how, despite outside dis disparagement uh, persisting in the search for long-lived particles, may not earn you a presidential phone call, but still yields successful collaboration with 3,000 colleagues. Indeed, in her descriptions of the synergistic nature of the work at the Large Hadron Collider, it speaks to an intricately productive environment in which I one day hope to work. And finally, with respect to Marie Gopert Mayer and a life well lived both academically and socially speaking, Professor Franklin's remarks further cemented the significance of humanity and humor within an academic setting. Be it through analysis of photographs for information beyond the mundane, or scandalous stories of romantic policies, um, she brought a depth and engaging depiction of the oft unseen side of the sciences, something that we would never have been able to have gleaned from papers or books. It was through this unique delivery that the passion for the sciences can be maintained, and I'm ever so grateful to witness the spark of an interest in physics firsthand. Making physics fun encouraging the future physics warriors. And throughout the talk, the beauty of particle physics prevailed. Double beta, uh, beta disintegration striking symmetry, the stability of certain isotopes, element production from neutron star mergers, onion-like detectors, all speak to the smallest, most fundamental aspects of the universe while addressing the bigger questions. How did we get here, and where are we going? It has been an edifying evening, and I again thank Professor Franklin for giving me a new appreciation of the subject. I know I'll be ruminating on maintaining a personal journal and the state of my physics brain for quite some time. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for coming, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. That was incredible. You're, that was wonderful. I can't believe you did that. That was so good. It was incredible.